Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Printed Circuit podcast, where we'll discuss trends, challenges, and opportunities across the printed circuit industry. I'm your host, Steph Chavez. In this episode, we'll focus on design reuse. And here to join me in this discussion is my dear friend and industry colleague, Carlos Gasca, who's a specialist and application engineer at L3 Harris Technologies. Thanks for being here, Carlos. Thanks for having me, Steph. I'm excited to be here. Carlos, can you give our audience a brief introduction of yourself? So a little bit about me, I started working at UTC Aerospace Systems in 2017. It's now known as Raytheon Technologies, and I left in 2022. And that same year, I started working at L3 Harris. While I was at Raytheon Technologies, I was working as an electrical design engineer. And then now at L3 Harris, I'm working as an application engineer. So here at L3 Harris, I'm currently helping the organization move away from Cadence and move towards the Siemens tool suite, so Expedition EDM. So I've used the tools in terms of an end user as a designer, but now as an admin as well. That's great. Yeah, you know, you and I both spent some time at our previous employer together. So we definitely will be able to have a, a great discussion on design reuse, especially when we talk about the, the time savings that we can gain. And especially you as a double E down in the lab of using known good valid circuits. But before I, you know, let the cat out of the bag, let's get right into it. And then I'm going to ask you, why doesn't design reuse work today when it comes to reusing it and utilizing circuitry that's known, valid, and good, or much less that's designed by another double E that maybe not be in your division or in your current uh, location where you're at? So I think the biggest issue right now is that most engineers are hesitant to use another engineer's work because they're not quite sure what requirements that design was built off of or where the analysis or the standard work, where is that located? Can they view it? Is it attached to the design? Has that design been in service? And if it has, for how long? So an engineer at times, rather than going to do that work up front, they might as well just redesign their own circuit because there's no traceability of where that design has been. So that's one of the biggest issues. I think another issue is within a large organization, each business unit does things a little bit differently in terms of like a central library, for example, they do different footprints. So when it comes to reuse, you really need to have one strong central library. So that way you can reuse that design from the front end being the schematic and the back end being the layout. So you can just plug it into any design and it would work in a modular way. So I think those two are the the main reasons why design reuse isn't fully implemented in some organizations. You nailed a little uh, sweet spot or a little sour spot that I always have with inconsistent libraries, especially you talk about large, large organizations that where you have divisions that at once were a standalone company. And now they get pulled into a collective where, you know, the, as these companies merge and migrate into under one fold you tend to have a lot of standalone libraries. And then you talk about design reuse. It's how do you do it if you're not even consistently using the same land patterns, you know, from design to design or from business unit to business unit. And then you think about the analysis that was done or not done. And maybe this division believes very heavily in that, whereas that other division may not. So the validation of that circuit isn't quite up to the level of expectations. So yeah, there's so many different concerns that could pop up. And, uh, you know, I can see why design reuse is not so easily acceptable and there's resistance uh, for that. And so as a end user, as an electrical engineer, I, I know when I was designing, I would look at past or legacy designs, right? And then for some circuits, for example, a high side discrete, you would have different variations from different, I guess, project product. And at times you would want to reuse that but without knowing what requirements that design was built to or where that analysis is for that design. It was hard to fully reuse without having to redo the work And especially if that design was done in an older tool suite or in a different tool suite, for example, if it's on Cadence and you're trying to reuse it and mentor, there's a whole translation process you have to go through, making design reuse quite difficult. And from, I guess, an admin point of view, um, that's one of the major things we're running into is that either it's from a different tool, now we have to translate it, which is a lot of overhead, in order to reuse that design, or each business unit has a different central library. So now you have to go through the, the effort of combining everything. That's what I'm seeing right now from an admin also as an end user. You definitely have a unique perspective, you know, and I think that's the advantage of bringing to L3 Harris is that you, you have that unique perspective of being a true double E down in the trenches and then now being on the other side of being a tool admin of attacking you know, what it takes to transition into a more optimized system or ecosystem, especially when you talk about multidiscipline and multi-domain integration. And oh, that's even a whole nother Pandora's box to discuss. We'll say for another time. When we talk about uh, problems or we know what the problems can be, what would be the best solutions or the best practices uh, for designers that 
they should implement or how they should approach this. Give me your take on that. I'm just going to start at a macro level. So one is getting the whole organization on the same common ground in terms of, I'm going back to the central library. Let's work off one central library. Let's get that as our starting point. And then from there, it's really understanding your taxonomy, PI, how you want to build your, your managed blocks, your, your reusable designs. How are you going to structure that? You're going to have your analog designs, RF, power, kind of have like these buckets. Because ultimately, those will be pushed out to a central library so that the community can use them. So that's more from a macro level. But from a micro level, when it comes to design, it's really you know getting your requirements, your analysis for each of the blocks defined or each of the designs defined and kind of keeping that with the design for the life cycle of that design. So that way, other engineers can just quickly look at the design and be like, okay, this meets my needs. And then even going a little bit more micro, especially in the layout, I think it's best practice probably use the least amount of layers when designing a, a reusable block. Because you can always go from like six layers to 10 layers, but you can't take a 16 layer reusable design and try to shove that into a four layer stack up. Understanding long-term use of your modules is key. And then you try to make do as best you can. But the, the key, I think you nailed it from the beginning, is you, you got to buy into it. The team has got to buy into it. The company, I always say one of the biggest hurdles to change, especially in larger corporations, is the resistance of the culture. The culture is resistant to change. And if the culture doesn't buy into change and evolution, it doesn't matter what methodologies to produce gold. They, they, it just won't, won't take hold and it won't, it won't be done. And then they'll stick to the legacy ways of doing things, and which today's day, you, you've got to be able to evolve, especially when it comes to design reuse. And when I discuss design reuse at different conferences and different presentations, and it's amazing how much resistance is still there in implementing it. So when we talk about what doesn't work or why it doesn't work, can you walk me through some examples of how in your vision or, or how you would see it does work? I know you and I both tag teamed uh, on some major projects and really hit home runs with designing uh, very complex designs very quickly utilizing design reuse. You know, as you attack the front end and I attack the, uh, the back end and we did it concurrently as well, which added even more horsepower to what we were doing. So yeah, can you walk me through this? Some examples that do work or how to get to that point. One is really understanding what your design reuse will be. You don't want it to be over complex. You also don't want to have a you know, a reusable block that's just like an AND gate, for example, because now you just have simple components and a block and doesn't provide much use. So one is really understanding what is it that you're trying to reuse and how can this be reused in multiple designs? Kind of have to think ahead. Um, you want to make it as generic as possible. It can be used down the line, but still meet your requirements. So that's, I think, the biggest hurdle is understanding what will be in your, in your reusable design. So once you get that implemented, my experience is using Expedition Designer for my reusable blocks. So once you get your, your block that you want to reuse, you'll go ahead and create that as a managed block, and then we'll push that into to layout. And so you have your front end attached to the managed block, and you also have your back end attached to the managed block. The reason I bring this up is because in the end of the day, once it's in the EDM library or the central library, it'll be treated as a, as a simple component. So you can copy and paste that same managed block in the front end, and you can have several instances of that. And the nice thing is that if the layout is already attached to that managed block, you can easily replicate that on the layout end. So I guess one question I had kind of going back to the previous subject about best practices and problems for you stuff. One of the things I struggled with was really understanding the what should be in a block. And I know what a lot of discussions we had in the layout is what's the best way that we can maximize the surface area when it comes to a managed block, either using the top and bottom effectively or just making all the managed blocks on the top layer, on the bottom layer, I guess from that experience, what lessons learned did you take away from, from design with managed blocks? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked that because the typical question you would hear in the industry is, well, it depends. For example, if all your components are on one side, of course, it's going to take up more real estate in the overall block. But the positive side of that is that when you get that block into your layout, then you can easily place one block on top of another block, on the one on the primary side and one on the secondary side. Whereas if the block had components, if the individual block or individual module had components on both the primary side and secondary side, then you cannot place that on one side or the other of the board. Then uh, you're restricted to only using that in that, that area throughout the board, both in, in the Z axis. So 
if I had my choice, I would like to have everything on one side and then allow me to bring that into design and then utilize it as best I can. And if that means that I have to push the block to where now I have to break it down and maybe on the fly, I move stuff to get it to fit exactly where I need it to fit in the area. Me as a designer, I want to have that flexibility in doing that. And if I like that version of the block, I can then save it back into the library as a revised version of that block and then utilize and have multiple versions of that block. Because let's face it, one of the biggest reasons why designers and engineers don't utilize reuse because every widget they're designing, the real estate allocation is not the same. You have heat sinks, mounting holes, you may have cutouts in your board. And so your real estate allocation is different. So a module that may fit in one design in that same area, length and width, size-wise, may not fit on the new design. So you're going to have to push it and flatten it, flatten that module so that way you can manipulate it. So then some people say, well, then why don't you just do it from the beginning? I would rather take a module, place it in my design, and if I have to flatten it, only change 20 or 30% of that module rather than having to redo the entire module from scratch every time. And for you as a double E, you know that when you're down in the lab and you fire that board up for the first time, you have a higher potential for success because you've mitigated your risk or minimized your risk. Because like the last time, the last design you and I both worked on, as true to the other two designs, the two uh, versions of the board, it fired up and worked right out of the gate. And why? Because we used known certified vetted circuits, proven circuits that were already in assembly or are in production. They were already on aircrafts. Exactly. Yeah, we reference legacy designs for, for our prototypes. And I think one thing is having good communication between the layout designer and the electrical designer, because I know... We had designed a power supply that, without getting too many details, it was rather large, right? And it made it difficult to kind of make that block flexible in terms of how we're going to lay it out. One of the lessons learned was kind of, we should take that block and divide it into smaller blocks, right? So that way we can easily lay that out and maybe maneuver it so that way we can condense the board space. So having those conversations and kind of rolling your lessons learned back into your design practice, I think is what makes design reuse successful. Communication is key. That's at the core of engineering 101, in my opinion, you cannot communicate enough. It's like they say in real estate and housing, the three th- most important things are, are location, location, location. Well, I would say in board design, it's communication, communication, communication. You can't have enough of it. Most definitely that, that, that is key. And I, you pointed out some great best practices that I, I would agree wholeheartedly with you on. So, you know, we talked about the different examples of how it worked. Can we now shift a little bit on the roadblocks? What do you see as the roadblocks that get in the way of implementing the best kind of practice. I know we talked about culture and not being on the same library. Is there anything else you'd like to add to that? Because this is one of the, the biggest things that we see as to why reuse isn't implemented throughout the industry on an everyday basis. We talked about culture. That's a big thing. But I think a lot of it is traceability. I know a lot of the questions I would get asked is, where is this design used and what product? And it's hard in the current systems kind of tracing down that that design. I know uh, we're implementing EDM Collaborate at the moment. And within that, you can kind of see where, or not kind of, you can see where that block's being used and what products, what designs. And that gives you a bit more confidence that, all right, this block is being used by other designers in these, these projects. So I think that's one of the biggest roadblocks is if you just see a design, you're not quite sure the confidence level of that design. But knowing where it's been used, that enables the electrical engineer to confidently use that block. And I, I think when you start designing with managed blocks, I know Exhibition has system designer. I know there's other tools as Cameo. You can start creating blocks at a higher level and slow that down to the schematic. Uh, you really want to understand your interfaces of that block. And a lot of that has to do with the requirements and the analysis. The analysis may not be one-on-one for every project. It won't be based on the requirements. But having some understanding of what this design can do will help that engineer select that block, right? Rather than starting from scratch, they can start with a block. I keep saying block, but it's a design, a design that meets certain criteria of the requirements and then modify it there to meet 100% of the requirements. Similar to layout, how you mentioned, you'd rather do 20, 30%, kind of massage that rather than starting from 100%. Same thing applies to the front end. I'd rather start with a design that I know has some confidence level, meets some of my requirements, and has 
a repository of that analysis where I can go look at what the other engineer did and build off of that rather than starting from scratch. And I, I think one thing that is really great about design and reuse is if implemented correctly, you save a lot of time. I, I know we were able to knock out the front end and the back end within like a, I think eight to nine months of, of just design work. And we did that for three years in a row, just knocking out a design after design. And it was just two people really, really working on it, at least on the front end and back end. We had supporting team members, but in terms of using the tools, it was just, I believe, two individuals. So it is amazing what design reuse can do. You're right. You know, when we worked on, on that, that major project there, the ability of being able to meet the, the schedule and especially, uh, you know, the project budget and getting to market as quickly as you can. Those are the, the big things that the project meetings that you got to report on. They don't want to know the nitty gritty details that you and I, to me, that, that's our bread and butter, but they want the high level, you know, are we on time? Are we on budget? Are we meeting requirements? You know, I've seen you in many of design reviews where other senior technical fellows or uh, engineering leads asking, well, where did this stuff come from? How, you know, who, who created this? And, and, or how did you come up with this? How did you come up with this interface? And are you sure it's creating this rather than you're having to defend, well, I, I'm guessing or I, I'm estimating that, or this is my theoretical calculations instead. You have hard facts of, no, this is reuse and this is what's on this platform on this aircraft and it's in production and it gives you a more solid foundation and uh, more confidence in the entire team of knowing that our finished product is going to work as designed or as the intent to, to meet our requirements. Yeah, so I, I think it's great. So we talked about the roadblocks of implement and we see implementing best practices, which is insufficient data sharing. It may be the trust in the design, uh, trusting another engineer's work or another designer's layout. And then of course, the biggest issue also to mention is there's really no pressure to change from the perspective of, well, what we're doing is good enough now and we're successful at it. And I don't want to do it on this project. We, we can't afford to do it on this. We'll do it on the next project, the next project, the next project. The next thing you know, it, 10 years has gone by, you're still doing the same legacy ways. There's so many different things uh, that, that come into play of uh, why implementing best practices on design reuses. There's just so much resistance to that. So how do you think uh, someone can overcome these roadblocks uh, within their organization when it comes to design reuse, Carlos? So I know I've been kind of sounding like a broken record on this, but it's really having the organization be on common ground because going to your point, uh, people, it's hard for people to change at times. If you're 10, 20 years into a process, it's a lot harder to combine all that into, into one central location. Because for design reuse to really work, you can have one source of design data, right? Or a footprint or your library. So the sooner you can implement that, the more successful you'll be down the road. Because I know there's been several instances where we really want to push for reuse but business units design footprints in one way due to one reason they've been doing it for 20 years and another business unit does something different so you have a schematic that you can possibly use but when it comes to layout if you're using different footprints it's really going to tear that layout apart you're going to have to massage it or redo it and it defeats the purpose of reuse so i think that's the most important thing to overcome in terms of roadblocks and then after that is just having a good repository where you can store the requirements that design was designed to in your analysis. And I, I know right now L3 Harris, we're using EDM design for our repository for our analysis and design. And I believe Siemens will be migrating to implementing that into EDM Collaborate. So that repository will help with the confidence of the end, of the electrical engineer of understanding where this block, where the design came from and where it's being used and what analysis helps support the design. So those are the, the two main things I can see that can help an organization overcome the roadblocks. Couldn't agree with you more on that. Yeah, you're definitely right. That's great, Carlos. You know, we've covered a lot here in a very short period of time on reuse and whether it's culture, uh, resistance, whether it's individuals, a company's uh, culture, or, or just uh, trusting another designer's work. So that this is definitely um, potential for growth and, and optimization in, in implementing this if and when it, it makes it, uh, and it to use to your advantage. But, you know, I can't thank you enough for um, giving us some insight. So, you know, I think we've outlined, you know, what we see on best practices when it comes to design reuse. Carlos, I want to thank you again for your invaluable insight on, on this subject. It's really good. And you definitely, I know you definitely um, have significant experience with design reuse and the advantages that it, it brings to the table and the success we, we've had with implementing it. So thanks again for uh, being here. Of course, uh, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Awesome. 
So tune in to our next episode where we talk about constraint-driven design.